Kerry Nivia Bandi is legendary for leading the first women-only demonstrations against Burundi's president in 2015. She defied police beatings, tear gas, and water cannons to make women's voices heard. Welcome to Dissidents and Dictators, a series of conversations by the Human Rights Foundation dedicated to exposing and challenging authoritarianism around the world. My name is Mohamed Keita. I'm a policy advisor at the Human Rights Foundation. I'm honored to welcome Keri Nivia Bandi, a poet, a journalist, a mother, and an iconic pro-democracy activist from Burundi. We will be discussing women's contributions to human rights and democracy in her country, as well as art and activism. Today we'll be talking about the situation in Burundi. Burundi is a small landlocked nation tucked between Rwanda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Tanzania. It is, the, a, it is a country the size of Belgium. It has 11 million people. Kerry, you are a former journalist and a poet. In 2015, as Burundi slipped towards dictatorship, you became a leader of the pro-democracy movement. Take us through the process that marked your entry into activism. Um, thanks for that question, Mohammed. I think um, there's no linear answer to that. I think it's a long, um, it's a long process. I'm someone who has always been uh, very concerned with uh, social justice, collective justice. Uh, always been interested in politics very much. In fact, I wanted to study political science, but um, I ended up doing international relations. So I had always followed very closely what was happening um, uh, in my country and um, returned. I had studied outside of uh, Burundi, but then wanted to come back home and to really uh, contribute to the, the well-being of, of my country by being a journalist. And so um, you have to keep in mind that Burundi went through a civil war uh, for about 10 years. And when I returned to Burundi in 2003, we were just emerging out of that civil war. And so I contributed, you know, through my work in a, in a, in a radio station, a Pan-African radio station, to uh, bring forward a new, you know, a, a new, more free, more democratic Burundi. That's what we're all dreaming of. And so when 15 years later, um, after I had watched the government of Nkurunziza deteriorate over the years, and um, uh, finally in 2015, when his two terms were ending, um, and when I saw, I really understood the gravity and the importance of the moment, I realized that if he uh, went ahead for a third uh, term that was against the constitution, not only was he going to violate the constitution, more importantly, and that's what really drove me, uh, it risked uh, the, the peace that we had worked so hard as a people to achieve. And so I could tell that uh, as many others, uh, you know, who, who all joined, uh, joined me, I could tell that we were at a critical juncture. And that if that continued, uh, we risked uh, jeopardizing the, you know, the peace agreement, the Arusha peace accords that uh, had been brought forward after the, the war, and that we very much risked going back into a conflict. So that's what really drove me. It's the, um, the I would say, the exasperation with cyclical wars in my country. I didn't want my children to... Um, have to flee or to grow up in a country that was again torn by conflict, uh, that was again torn by poverty, by corruption. I wanted a better Burundi, not, not just for myself, but for my children and, and all the children of Burundi. And that really is what uh, drove me with so much passion to, um, to activism and really what I call active citizenship, not just activism, but really active citizenship. Very good. Back then you were a mother, as you alluded to, and as you are now. How do you experience being a mother and an activist? That's a great question. That's a great question because often when we think, especially um, in, in, in 
in violent contexts, when we think of the resistance against uh, oppression and authoritarianism, that uh, the face of that resistance is not uh, often that of a woman or of a mother. And um, I sometimes wonder if that's not deliberate. Um, and yet women are very much present. And so experiencing that has been such an eye opener for me on what the experience is for for, for women uh, for instance when i was organizing the protests and when we were protesting in the streets i received so much um condemnation from people who were uh, close to me and who thought that i was doing some something deeply irresponsible as a mother putting myself as at risk uh, and then risking my children being orphaned and, 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 you know, and, and not growing up, um, you know, with, with uh, their mother with them or having a peaceful childhood. And um, that has always baffled me because I think as a mother, your first instinct and your first desire is for your children to grow up in a peaceful society, in a just society. And um, the inability for some to, to, to connect the fact that if we do not stand up for a freer society today, our children will not be free when they are adults, uh, is something that I have a hard time uh, understanding. So actually for me, being a mother gives me even more incentive to be, uh, to be an activist. It's certainly more difficult, more uncomfortable, particularly being a, a single mother, it's, uh, it's very taxing and you do not enjoy the supports that um, many male activists have. Uh, the, this, the other side of activism is that often the male activists are the forefront, uh, you know, we see them uh, everywhere, uh, uh, but they have wives who are taking care of their children. When you are a mother uh, at the forefront of a, of, a, of a struggle like this one, you are also taking care of your children ensuring their well-being and often doing so on the run. And so the, it, it brings extraordinary uh, personal challenges that um, can often discourage some women from, from, from doing this. But um, I think for me, it was fundamental to be aligned uh, with my, um, my, my beliefs and my hopes for my children. Um, so yeah I'll, yeah, I'll just say it again. It, it is what motivates me. It is for my children that I would continue, that I continue. Otherwise, it's so much easier to keep quiet and just um, go with the status quo. There is a tendency in the West to think that women's activism or resistance movements, especially in Africa, are a new phenomenon. What do you say to that? <laughs> I almost have to laugh to that. Um, you know, African women have resisted oppression since uh, oppression has started existing. And um, I, I, you know, I come from a long line of, of resistance of strong women, I always say this, uh, who have always stood their ground. And uh, it's definitely not a first. Um, even in Burundi, in my country, even though our peaceful marches were a first in terms of size and um, political momentum, uh, it's it was definitely not the first time that women stood up against oppression. We've actually have a we have a legend, a legendary figure in Burundi, Namujandi, who in the early 30s uh, really led um, uh, a, a rebellion against uh, the Belgian colonial rule, and um, you know, and she was uh, so such a threat for for the colonial uh, regime that you know they brought forward uh, forces. Is, um, the the force publique, which is um, which was a, it is really the genesis of the police uh, in Burundi. It was a hybrid force of um, Congolese um, um, militiamen or policemen with uh, some mercenaries, and uh, together it was a force that was enforcing really at uh, the colonial rule at the time and crushing any dissent. And uh, they crushed her and silenced her and exiled her into a different province. But she's a major figure in our history. And if you look really across at the African continent, um, 
women have played an extraordinary role. I really would recommend uh, a paper released by Dr. Yolande uh, Buka, Women, Colonial Resistance and Decolonization, where she really documents the role that women have played in various African countries, starting from, you know, in South Africa, Namibia, Mozambique, and the role in uh, breaking the apartheid system and supporting the struggle for, for uh, emancipation and independence, but also in West Africa. And even when you think about the great leaders of our great freedom fighters, you know, our African idol, uh, idols and icons, people like Thomas Sankara or, or Patrice Lumumba, uh, what you realize is that their wives were hugely, hugely influential and were very political and had um, and often influenced their policies uh, to a great extent, but they have been silenced by uh, by history, unfortunately. So I think part of the work um, is really to begin to document more African women's role in in political uh, struggles. And the argument that you that Dr. Buka makes is that really colonialism is the one that diluted the power and the influence of African women, which has always been there uh, prior to our colonial times. What is, what is the role that women can play in overturning dictatorship? I think that we cannot imagine or achieve freedom without the freedom of all, um, all the individuals in society. And uh, to me, actually, the, the struggle for women's liberation is deeply, deeply connected to the fight against dictatorship. When you think about it, what dictatorship does, the same as patriarchy, is to set up a system where you install fear, you install uh, self-doubt in, in those that you are oppressing. So you've got one power that is exercising power over, over another. And it's the same format, it's this, exactly the same format that happens in, in patriarchy. In fact, I often think that patriarchy, uh, sorry, that dictatorship is uh, patriarchy at a societal level. And uh, too often we focus on the effects of patriarchy on women, not enough on what patriarchy has in terms of effect on a society at large and it's no uh it's no coincidence that the the countries that that oppress women the most are often the most authoritarian ones uh, and that's where you have the harshest uh, dictatorships and and because really oppression begins at the individual level you have to understand how a dictatorship um, operates and installs itself it begins by feeling, making every individual in society feeling uh, so afraid uh, for speaking up for themselves and uh, that they actually enable the, the, the dictatorship to continue. So I'm deeply convinced that um, in, in order to reverse dictatorship, you have got to work on very actively and to dismantle uh, patriarchy, which is a system that, you know, silences women. Um, and I often find that, you know, my male counterparts who are fighting for human rights and uh, or who are activists uh, don't give this enough importance and focus on systems. But systems are made up of people. And if you've got a mass of, of people who are truly free, uh, and, and, you know, and if you are, you have women who are free and who are liberated, then you are definitely marching towards a freer state. I think you cannot disconnect the two and it's a grave, grave mistake to do so. As a poet, do you think art has a role in overturning authoritarianism? Absolutely, absolutely. The power, the incredible power that art has, and the reason why dictatorships are so often so wary and afraid of artists, is that um, art is able to dismantle, um, is, is able to penetrate the imagination uh, of, of citizens, and is able to dismantle the fear that dictators uh, uh, you know, place among citizens. Um, dictatorships, will not, when you think about it, dictatorships are systems that are led by a handful of people over a huge majority. So logically, uh, they should not, um, they cannot sustain themselves 
if this majority rejects the, the dictatorship. And so dictatorship survives on citizens feeling powerless. That is, that is a critical um, aspect of oppression. You've got to convince your citizens that they are too weak or they are, too, they are not able to, they're too overwhelmed to take on the dictatorship. Once you do that, you can oppress. And, and that's a strategy of oppression everywhere. And so what art does is that it's able to stretch the, the civic um, uh, imagination. It's able to stretch the mind, the heart uh, of the citizens and have them imagine other scenarios. And in the process of imagining other scenarios, you now begin an inner revolution. And, and that is why art is so critically important and so vital in any, uh, in any oppressed society. And that's often why also once um, you have more democratic systems in place, you'll find that a country is flourishing in the art, on the art scene. Um, but during a dictatorship, often it's very difficult to do true art. You may have performance, you may have entertainers, but it's difficult to have um, to see true art because it, it is. It's a, a very difficult work to do, and it is a form, a very active, important form of resistance. So um, I think that poetry is even more capable of that as it evokes. Um, it goes beyond the logical, beyond the reality, and it evokes other, it awakens other parts of a human being and uh, takes you to places that no one else can take you and makes you dream other dreams. And you begin to hunger for those dreams. You begin to hunger for that, free, that freedom um, that, that, you know, that you feel in, in poetry. And so it is, it is critical, but don't let the dictators know. <laughs> <laughs> The protest movement you led in Burundi called for respect of the constitution. It was largely peaceful, but the police responded with tear gas, beatings, and live ammunition. Why were the police so violent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, police brutality is an issue that we're seeing globally, right? It's not just, uh, it's not just in Burundi. And um, police brutality operates... Um, is often is a weapon of an oppressive government. And so in the case of Burundi, they were under clear uh, instructions and clear directions. In fact, we could see in our initial protests, uh, we could see in the eyes of the policemen who were stopping us and who were, uh, you know, tear gassing us, we could tell that they were having an inner conflict. Uh, because they had been used to, to tear gassing young men um, who seemed more of a threat to them. But seeing women who were unarmed, looking them, women who look like their own mothers, their own sisters, and this is what we would tell them in the streets. We would say, we are your sisters, we are your, your mothers, you know, we are your daughters. And you could tell that it was very difficult for them to uphold that mission, that, um, that uh, Ill illegitimate mission that had been given to them. And what happened is that they were quickly replaced by other uh, more violent um, policemen, many of them who, had been, who were former rebels and who were re more ready to... Um, to go forward and shoot us or, or tear gas us. So you, I think it's important to understand, to see police brutality as an arm of, um, of dictatorship and authoritarianism. That's the arm with which you enforce the fear. And in the beginning, in 2015, when they started that repression, uh, people still had a sense of their own freedom. They, they you know, they, we kept resisting, but a few years, Later, uh, with daily repression, daily brutality, what happens is um, people become so afraid for themselves, for their loved ones, for their children, that they prefer to be um, silent. Uh, and um, that is, yeah, that is the effect of police brutality. Uh, and, and so um, I guess to answer your question, it's a symptom. It's more of a symptom uh, of, a, of a problem than a problem in itself. And I think you've got to get to the root. Who does police brutality serve? 
and uh, in order to fully answer that question. One of the most iconic moments of the protest movement involved yourself when you decided to walk alone in the middle of the streets towards a police water cannon truck. Uh, this was in the middle of a protest. Take us back to that tense moment. Right, right. So this was on May 13th, 2015. Um, it was our second uh, march, peaceful march, women only led. And this was the day that the uh, East African community had convened, East African heads of states had convened uh, in Tanzania for an emergency summit on Burundi, which uh, our president at the time, Pierre Nkurunziza, was also attending. And so we decided to hold our protest that day to uh, make our voices so loud and so heard across borders um, and, and to say that we were against the violation of the constitution and against risk of flipping back into violence. So we had started gathering uh, early in the morning uh, in town. Mind you, during the protests, uh, uh, protesters had been trying to get to the city center for days and the police would block them um, from 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 entering the city center uh, specifically one spot which is called uh, place de la revolution uh, uh, sorry place de l'indépendance uh, which is where we have our statue of our independence hero we protesters wanted to gather there and sort of make it a sort of tahir square if you know if you wish and nobody nobody had been able to do that so we organized as women we organized differently uh, we used different tactics and we just got into town one by one individually and then regrouped at a certain time. Uh, we had spread the word, uh, you know, uh, via our own ways. And, and then all of a sudden, here we were. And so the police, uh, we were met by the police who came and, um, you know, tear gassed us and was trying to deter us to make us run away. And a number of women ran away, but a number of us stayed and we stayed put and we kept marching towards that place, that, that symbolic place de l'indépendance. Um, but under so much uh, repression from the police, you know, we had been tear gassed, women had been beaten. We were, you know, we, we resisted for three hours in the streets. And so by the time um, I knelt down uh, on that photo, um, I was exasperated. Uh, I was sick and tired of these policemen uh, for whom we, you know, who we feed by our taxes, attacking us um, mercilessly for hours. And it was a way for me to say, to tell them, uh, how dare you? How dare you shoot us? How dare you... Um, violate us to this extent when you see us marching peacefully as you know as daughters and 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 women of this country and and what is your legitimacy to do this and um but you have to keep in mind that it was an extremely dangerous time the police had been shooting people with live bullets so many people had been um had been killed uh, prior to that so it was an extraordinary risk but for some strange reason, I don't recall feeling fear in that moment. I recall feeling uh, completely in alignment, being exactly where I needed to be. And um, even to this day, it's not something that I would uh, I would do it all over again, because at the end of the day, um, you know, um, we we we're we're only here for a short time. We we'll all know that we're going to die. I think it's Toni Morrison who says it so well you're born that's one thing you know you cannot uh change that you're going to die one day and that's something you cannot change the 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 goal is to do something useful in between and um i have always felt that um it is better to die for something that you believe in it's better to die in accordance to your values than to live a life that is unfree 
water cannons can cause serious injury. You put your body on the line and took the blast. How did you manage to survive this ordeal? You know, the ability of human beings to adapt is incredible. When we went in there, I had never been tear gas like that before. I had never been under water cannon. I had never been under, I had never had um, a, a gun pointed to my belly and uh, someone looking at me in the eye and being ready to shoot. Um, so these are things I had never experienced. And in the beginning, the first time you see that, the first time you meet a very scary incident like that, you're of course scared. So I recall, for instance, the first day of our marches, uh, having this policeman stop us, pointing this gun in my, in my uh, belly and saying, you need to re go back or we will shoot. And you have to make that incredible, impossible choice in seconds. And I recall, feeling literally like my stomach was going to rupture. <laughs> I thought I was going to literally uh, collapse and my I felt my knees getting so weak. But what I did is I held the hands of my other sisters who were with me and looked him back in the eye, although I was trembling inside and said, no, we're going forward. And so the same thing has happened when we were being tear gas and when I was getting those blasts is that um, I was afraid at first, but very quickly I understood. I began to understand how tear gas uh, works. I began to, and we all did collectively, we began to realize that if you put your head down, you cover your, your, you know, your, your mouth and your nose, you do not inhale. Uh, if we stick together and we, when they are blasting us, if we all make a group, and, and, you know, and kneel down, they will only blast our backs, not our fronts, not our, uh, the soft areas of our bodies. And we'll be able, as they recharge their cannons, we are able to march forward. So these are things that we were learning on the ground. And um, you realize, because what, what is driving you is so much stronger than the fear. And so you're able to go and to discover that you have abilities you even you never suspected you had. Uh, you, you, you realize that really, um, you know, leadership actually emerges in times like that. And um, that this is actually something you are ready even to die for. And so um, we adapted, we fought them for, for, for three hours, we resisted and uh, we were ready to continue. Uh, absolutely, would have gone on for, for, uh, for a long time uh, had we not been interrupted by, by a coup that happened uh, right when we were in the streets. But it speaks to um, the ability of, of the human spirit to endure when it, is, it knows what it's looking for and what it's working for. And I think we've seen that around the world. Yeah, definitely fascinating. Now, the man who plunged Burundi into dictatorship, Pierre Nkurunziza, just died unexpected, unexpectedly. The regime said it was a heart attack, but there is quite a lot of suspicion that he died of COVID-19. Please explain why that would be ironic. Yeah, I think it's... Um very ironic indeed. Uh, one of the last acts of, uh, of Munziza's government was to really um, deny the existence of COVID-19 and the risks that it posed on uh, Burundi and Burundians. So in many public rallies, it was said that um, Burundi was safe because God was protecting it. You've got to keep in mind that Munziza um, has used um, spirituality and religion as a way to cement his power. He has often made reference to him being divinely ordered to rule Burundi. And so he often goes on these tangents and speaks about what God has has told him or what God has installed for Burundi. And, and you know, and so he publicly said that uh, there is no need to wear masks because God had purified the air of Burundi. And so the country didn't take any measures. His government didn't take any preventative measures to uh, protect the population. And um, as we speak, um, there are 
it's difficult to estimate how many people are uh, suffering uh, from from the pandemic how many victims the pandemic has left behind but we definitely know that covid is um taking numerous lives in burundi and so uh, what happened is that in uh, it began his entourage began to be um to, to suffer from from uh, the pandemic, starting with a minister of health who him, who uh, who was admitted, and uh, later his wife who had to be evacuated to uh, Nairobi, Kenya, on a on a private helicopter, you know something that you know is 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 uh, outrageous when you think about it that you will not take any measures to protect your people, and when your own uh, are affected, you fly them out, knowing that 99% of the population is unable to even dream of getting on a private helicopter out of the country. And um, so shortly after that, it was reported that he was also ill, and uh, and so he died in mysterious circumstances in what very many um, believe is COVID-19. Um, what, a, what an ironic... Um, turn of events indeed but again how sad how sad that um you know a country would have to come to that and so even now uh that he has died for instance his his uh, his funeral happened a few days ago uh, in the stadium where nobody i think only two people were wearing a mask uh, it, it's absolutely absurd you recently wrote an op-ed entitled, I cry not for Kurunziza, but for the lives he broke. I was struck by a comparison you made between Kurunziza and the late Chilean dictator, Augusto Pinochet. Yes, I think um, it's difficult to really assess a dictatorship while it's uh, ongoing, because as you know, anyone who has lived through a dictatorship knows uh, the flow of information is uh, cut under dictatorship. Uh, you cannot really document how many people, how many victims um, uh, the, the regime has caused. And it's often after the fact that you begin to really, uh, you know, investigate and that people are able, are free enough to come forward and say, Yes, my brother was abducted. My sister was raped. You know, these stories often only emerge after the regime has been um, has been overturned. And yet, in Burundi, uh, the numbers we have right now these are official numbers, and to me, they are a gross underestimation of the numbers. Are at least uh, close to two thousand people um, dead since twenty fifteen. And, and, and bearing that in mind, knowing that this is, a, you know, an underestimation and you compare it to the victims that um, the Pinochet regime left behind in 16 years, uh, which is close to 4,000, it's unbelievable that in five years, uh, we are over half of what Pinochet did in 16 years in Burundi. And these are, again, I repeat, official numbers. So I shiver, I genuinely shiver uh, at the thought uh, of what we will uncover once this regime, this system uh, is reversed and we finally get to a freer Burundi. Um, I am very um, pessimistic about the um, the extent of the violence and the degree of violence uh, of this regime. And um, uh, yes, uh, I hope that history will do it justice, but um, I also know that it's very difficult to bring back uh, what has been lost. And I think that was the uh, core message of my uh, op-ed. It's saying, yes, he, he, he's dead, he leaves, but what he leaves behind are broken lives that is going to be so difficult to repair, some of them impossible. That is part of his legacy, that's part of his heritage. And uh, our heritage, therefore, is to find ways, imagine ways to rebuild, to bring back life 
into um, such a hollow, hollow space that he lives behind. In the same piece, you talked about how Kurunziza once inspired hope for democracy after he was first elected in 2005. Please reflect on those early days. What went wrong? Right, yes. So in the, in the early days, Kurunziza came to power in 20, 2005. Um, I had just returned to Burundi after my university studies. I was working at a newly open uh, Pan-African radio station, uh, very progressive, and we were, uh, we were eagerly covering um, this election that brought him forth. He was the first um, democratically uh, elected leader out of a peaceful process after the war. So there was so much, there was so much hope um, in the country. I would want to say that he inherited in 2005 almost uh, a blank slate. He could have, and I think that's what I am, um, my greatest discomfort uh, with him and his rule is that he had an opportunity to take us forward and uh, to re truly rebuild the country, but um, he chose a different path. Of course, it's important to know that he's part of a, of a, of a broader and longer psych, uh, cycle of violence uh, that is fundamental. But he definitely had the opportunity. And when you have executive power, especially in Burundi, the, our constitution gives you um, very wide um, powers um, when you're an executive, um, when you are the leader of a country. So he had a possibility to make a lot of changes. And one, uh, and uh, prior to him being um, president, he had been a minister of good governance for, for uh, I think about two years, I can't recall exactly, but he had given a somewhat good impression of himself. And a part of his early measures were things like uh, providing uh, access, free access to education to all primary children, which was huge uh, because there had been a lot of discrimination, uh, ethnic discrimination in our education system. He provided access uh, to free maternal health care for women, which uh, made uh, you know women uh, were so... Uh, ecstatic about that. But very quickly, we realized that these measures um, were not followed up by substantial uh, investment. So yes, you make um, childbirth free for a woman, but you do not develop any infrastructure. And so what happens is then you've got many more higher demand to a service that is already crumbling. And so the service that they're getting is even worse. You find women getting to clinics uh, and just sitting in the corridors and giving birth in corridors um, or, or children being in classrooms that are, um, you know, that are um, completely dilapidated. Uh, one good thing that he did was to build a lot of classrooms. He did actually rebuild the infrastructure, but he didn't invest in the curriculum. He didn't invest in the teachers and in all the materials that, that children needed for, for education. So these should have been red flags for us in the very beginning. And then very quickly, what, in, what, uh, what, what also happened is that uh, anyone who was pointing to issues that were happening in his in his government corruption for instance were quickly eliminated uh, got someone like Ernest Manirumva, a leading activist who was um, abducted and illegally um, um, killed murdered and and his case has never been resolved to this day and that's because he was working on a corruption case so very quickly we saw, um, a tendency, not even a tendency, but actually a practice of assassinating or um, uh, extraditing or um, abducting people who were critics of the regime. And that is how slowly um, we, we went from uh, bad governance to actual dictatorship slowly. Mm. You alluded to ethnic discrimination. Now, Burundi has experienced violent upheavals, including the bloody civil war. 
uh, which have been fueled by tension between the two main ethnic groups in the countries, the Hutus, which are a majority of the population, and the Tutsi minority, which has historically dominated the elite. Now, how does ethnic identity impact activism and the rest of the society, politics, and life in general? Mm -hmm. um, I see, uh, I've never thought that ethnicity was a core issue in Burundi. That's my stance, uh, my personal stance. I see ethnicity as a tool um, that is used by those who governors to further divide and conquer. Uh, it was a tool that was used by our colonial powers. Uh, they invested heavily in um, creating and um, uh, fueling uh, tensions between the two ethnic uh, groups. And these tensions have been used time and time again by our leaders uh, since independence. So you've had the first three republics which were led by Tutsi men and which were profoundly in unjust. And uh, in fact, in the First Republic, you've got a, we had a genocide, a Hutu genocide in 1972, um, which um, where power has always asserted itself um, over another ethnic group. Uh, but what I think is critical to, to understand is that this, these ethnic tensions are done in order to assert and exercise power. And I think that's where, as citizens, we need to actually uh, be more conscious and understand that ethnic groups are being put one, uh, one against the other for the benefit of politicians, whatever ethnic group these may be from. So when you look at Murunziza and the way he led, there is nothing that differentiates him from the leadership of the First uh, Republic, for instance, which was Tutsi-led. Uh, and so wh wh what I want to uh, highlight is that the way power is practiced in Burundi is, has remained unchanged. It, it, sometimes it, it, you, know, it, you have some dress changing, and uh, so it's not a Hutu leader. It's, it, it's, sometimes it's a Tutsi leader who is you know, using oppression among the, the other ethnic group and fueling hate, uh, or it's the other way around. But at the end of the day, this benefits authoritarianism. And uh, I think what's fundamental for us to really achieve a new society is to dismantle that, that power that asserts itself on, on, um, the, uh, on ethnicity. And uh, I, so I see that in that light. That's how I see uh, Munziza's governance. And it's so evident when after 2015, when he sensed that his uh, power was really challenged, the rhetoric of the government became a lot more ethnicized. They focused a lot more and the communication arm of the government focused a lot more on um, ethnic, um, uh, you know, on ethnic allegations, on ethnic tensions, on fueling these tensions. For instance, uh, in, when, in 2015, when we had our protests, um, protests occurred across the city from all ethnic groups, um, you know, and even beyond the city. But the government, the regime in its communication kept talking about specific areas of the city and mentioning that it was only uh, one ethnic group that was leading the protest, which is untrue. It was absolutely untrue. It was he. They were resisted by all all ethnic groups. But in order to reassert themselves, they had to make it look like it's only one ethnic group, in order to gain the support of the other ethnic group. So it's an unfortunate um, way, a form of governance that is not new, and that is exactly what needs to be shifted and what needs to change uh, if we want a better, more just Burundi. Uh, which uh, puts um, the merit and uh, the competence of our leaders above their ethnicity. Now, Burundi was one of the rare countries in the world to hold a presidential election in the middle of the pandemic. Why weren't the elections free and fair? 
Well, they were not free and fair, not because of the pandemic. They were just not free and fair, period, because you've got a regime that wants to sustain itself in power. So throughout the uh, political, the, the campaign, the presidential campaign, for instance, the main opposition group, which is also uh, a Hutu, uh, which is led by a Hutu leader, um, same as as as, um, as Nguyenziza or his successor, um, yeah, members of that political party have been harassed, killed, murdered for months, for weeks, uh, you know, without fail. Almost every week you had the name of at least one or two leaders of that opposition party who had been attacked, who had been murdered. Many women leaders of that political party were murdered after being raped. And this went on for over a year leading up to the election. And so, um, for you know, I you know, I always say this: elections, um, free and fair elections, are not don't happen on the day of the election. They're the result of a free and fair process, and the the, the process was certainly not fair, and, and neither was it free. And um, you know, the electoral commission, for instance, it was made up of the majority of members of the regime, members, actual ministers of 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 the. Of, of of the of the government, um, you know the um, uh, the way that the elections themselves were conducted on even on election day, many members of opposition parties claimed that they were they didn't have access to um, the council votes uh, after that. Um, you know they contest the results of the elections uh, because what their agents have in terms of tallying is very different from what was announced. In fact, even the 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 the, the head of the um, electoral commission uh, made after making an official announcement of the results came back and said and apologized. He said that those were a draft and that he was going to announce new ones. I mean, it, the whole process was a joke. Uh, I think to add insult to injury is the fact that they happened during a pandemic without any measure whatsoever. That is, in, while the whole. Uh, world was on lockdown, wearing masks, and people were borders were shut, and people were staying home. Uh, you know, huge rallies were gathering in Burundi. Um, you know, for um, for you know for for the political campaign, for the electoral campaign, um, which is deeply, deeply unfortunate, and um, it is not who we are as a country and who we can be. Now, Burundi has a new president who is seen as a moderate within the ruling party. However, he has picked a prime minister who is under inter international sanction for his role in political repression. Mixed signals? Uh, I don't even think it is a mixed signals. I think these are very clear signals. So the um, he has just nominated his government. His prime minister uh, Guillaume Bunyoni is uh, was the minister of public security between 2015 and today. So that means that he was overseeing all the security forces in Burundi that uh, that launched the severe repression that we all know has been happening. Uh, that means that he led the policemen who basically tear gassed me in 2015. He was uh, overseeing all the operations of the police, of the intelligence services, and uh, all the agents of repression of the regime. He is actually uh, under sanctions, and um, and uh, now he is the prime minister. Uh, worse is the fact that. Um, the majority of the uh, of of the strong men in that regime are army generals. So besides the prime minister, you've got the presidential chief of staff. He's himself a general from the CNDD FDD party, the leading party, which was born out of a rebellion. So these are all generals from the rebellion. And the Minister of Interior is also a general himself, a man who is notorious for the uh, human rights violations that he committed between 2015 and today. Uh, he is actually listed by the 2017 UN Commission of Inquiry report 
for being responsible for gross violations of human rights. And now he is in charge of the Ministry of Interior. So it is, um, I mean, the, 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 this, this, this government, first of all, I'm very concerned because it seems that we're now under military rule with his generals uh, all leading the key posts and positions uh, of the government. But then it's also such a slap in the face of the victims of uh, the 2015 to today's uh, repression. And it, it, to me, it indicates no desire whatsoever to change. I think we hoped for a second that Evariste Naishimi, the new leader, would uh, take a different route. Uh, he had the opportunity to do so. He has the power to do so as a head of state, power conferred to him by a constitution, but he's chosen a different path. And uh, um, we, um, we are not in a good place uh, right now. Yes, as you alluded, five years on, the repression is still ongoing. There are still extrajudicial executions, disappearances, arbitrary arrests and beatings. More than 1,000 people have been killed. Uh, conservative estimates, you, you said it might even be up to 2,000. More than 300,000 Burundians live in exile, including most of the opposition, media, and civil society. Where do you see the hope? Mm -hmm. I think um, we have no choice but to have hope. Um, as a citizen of my country, I refuse to give up and believe that a handful of human beings who have decided to hold on to power for their own benefit at the expense of the rest of the population uh, will lead our country uh, to the ground. I think that is the hope, first of all. We've got to be um, conscious and, and a dream of a better future. Um, when you look at Burundi, you know, from an outsider's perspective, you just Google Burundi and look at the extent of damage and challenges that we face. Um, I often ask myself, is that the country that I know? Is that the country that I know and that I love? The Burundi I know and love is a different one. It's a Burundi of Ubuntu, this core belief in the humanity of all of us, and that has profound reverence for, for uh, other human beings, and um, is a culture of kindness, a culture of courage, um, a culture of strength, but a culture of collective strength and solidarity. Uh, that is the Burundi I know. It's a beautiful country. I think it's important to say this, especially for me as a poet. I'm constantly moved and I ache to see the green hills of my country. It's a beautiful, gorgeous country with so many resources and its greatest resource are its people. Our resilience is extraordinary. We've been through so many wars, we've been through so much hardship, and people are still able to carry on on a daily basis with, you know, going on with their lives. Um, something that I think it would be a tall order for any country uh, anywhere in the world, particularly in the West. Um, you know, we, we still survive and we still thrive. And that is where I, I find uh, my hope. My hope is that I know most Burundians want another Burundi. I know that for a fact. I know that it wants um, a country that is free and uh, provides freedom for all of its children. And that is what, that is what drives me. And uh, I think the task that we have, those of us who believe that so strongly, is to organize. Organize better, organize uh, in uh, more effective ways, and continue, continue to hold that dream uh, up high. It may not be something that I may even see in my generation or in my lifetime, but it doesn't, uh, it will not stop me from working for it uh, every single day of my life because um, I know that change is possible. And this is where I'm comforted by histories of other countries around the world. And when you look at countries that went through 
deeper, greater oppressions and that were able to overcome when it seemed completely impossible. This reminds me that uh, change is always possible. It's always possible. It depends on our drive, our determination and our consciousness. Mm -hmm. You now have been in exile for a few years. How are you continuing your activism from Canada? In many different ways, um, I have used my voice as um, not just as an activist, as a poet, but also my platform, um, particularly online, this is interesting, uh, to denounce, often to denounce uh, crimes that were ongoing. I found that this, this is a very effective method, um, sometimes when you can, you are able to save a few lives when we launch these campaigns online um, and we bring the attention to you know uh, either a murder or an abduction particularly uh, of, of, um, of uh, an individual on the country so sometimes it's on very precise things like that that we operate um, I have also seen as one of the few women who are this vocal uh, in, in Burundi knowing that Burundi is a culture again where um, women are traditionally silent when they are to be spoken for. Um, I take uh, my responsibility very seriously to make sure that other uh, women, especially young women, speak up and uh, speak their mind, liberate themselves. Uh, even if they don't speak necessarily about politics, I see their liberation as a as something that will lead us to a freer society. So I really work on that actively, uh, uh, of, you know, on offline as much as I do, uh, or even more than I do online. And um, I am investing myself even more now into my art. This is what I'm. Uh, this is where I'm currently at. Um, for a few years following the uh, my exile and the horrible uh, repression that was happening and the murders and so many people that i know who have died and have been uh, victims i couldn't write i wasn't able to write and um, i have now been able to do so again and so i'm focusing a lot more of my energy into that because as i said earlier i really believe that you know revolution is a, an intimate an intimate process it must happen first before we see it on the outside you must begin on the inside and you've got to be able to um, uh, make people dream alternative dreams i think even when you look at the black lives matter today and the the, the um, global revolution of black people around the world today it is a result of a long process of uh, self-affirmation and self-determination that begins often at very invisible levels and uh, that lead to one day all converging together into something big and public and, and visible. So I see public protests um, as only one item, only one and often the last um, uh, visible part, tip of the of an iceberg that must be constructed over time and fed and nourished and uh, encouraged for, for a long time. So that's where I see my role. Finally, what can people do to support activists in Burundi? I think um, we've, we've got different forms of activism and it's important to support them all. Uh, it's um, I want to start by saying that no one, uh, no non-Burundian is going to save Burundi. I think this is very, we have to make that very clear. Uh, we're not begging Western countries to come to save us. We're not begging uh, anyone to come to, um, you know, do to hold our own struggle. Uh, I think change will begin and will be launched and led and uh, um, conducted by Burundians uh, as it should. But I think there are there's a great importance uh, to give to uh, solidarity movements. What we are trying to do and what we're doing is not new. It's happened elsewhere and um, I really think it's important to connect uh, different movements 
So, um, you know, activist movements or activists from other countries have so much to teach us. And just like we have things that we can teach other uh, activists in other African countries, because what you find is that dictators are very have exercised so much solidarity among themselves. They give themselves tips. What you see happening when you what the repression that happened in 2015 was very quickly uh, reproduced in Congo, uh, Brazzaville, in the DRC. You know, you see these patterns uh, spreading. And you often see, and our dictators get support from other dictators who also give them tips on how to, you know, to further crush dissent. And I think we have to be bolder in our own solidarities with other activists. I think that's the greatest way to support us and um, and to further amplify the voices of uh, of activists. They do, our people back home are not able to comment. They're not able to publicly uh, support us, but what we say I know is often very, uh, very important in, um, you know, upholding the morale of, uh, you know, of, of our citizens um, and is important because no one else on the ground is able to speak up. So it's critical to support those who are uh, in exile as much as you support those who are inside. Well, Kerry, this has been such a fascinating conversation. I think we learned a lot about Burundi and the struggle um, as led by women, which is often not discussed. And um, it is so inspiring to hear about the resilience of the Burundian people, your own resilience through everything that you went through and the drive you have the courage you have, the grace you have. It's really inspiring. Thank you for sharing your yourself, your thoughts, your story with us. We have really appreciated our time with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Thank you. Remembering Burundi, I remember you, a spark tearing the blue sky. Seeds flirting with clouds, men confiding in stars. A song held warm and snug in dreamy backs. Women smelling of butter, a swollen breast, the Milky Way. Dew quenching the splintered feet. I remember you, a dream netted with laterite and steel. Proud men, chests bursting full, Spears hose laying still on the moist ground, walking naked to the sun. Butterfly girls, scattering, flying, soaking the heavens with colors. Smothered laughs, messy laughs, free laughs, laughter in thousands. I remember you. Poised people, truth people, masterly people. Cracked but whole people. Jade fleeing beauty, a jealous, wild, bewitching beauty, the kind to burn a prophet's eyes. A tiny scoop of land that once dared defy the Reich. I remember you, before your feather words, before your paper suns, before your gaping ground, your wandering children, before your dignity in crumbs for sale on the sidewalks of famished boulevards. I remember you in the furor of my nappy hair, in the ink snaking down these trembling hands, in my precious dreams powdered with dust, in my sweats, in my screams, in my fevers, in my eyes, dangling wide open from the crescent moon. I remember you, yesterday still, tomorrow, of course, this morning, I don't know.